we are live now yeah. start okay. welcome everybody to this uh, aios international ophthalmology conclave and uh, this has been running uh, for the past two days and today is the third and the final day we have 12 international societies who have uh, collaborated with us Uh, for this mega event and we are thankful to all of them we have uh, 150 international faculty from all over the globe who have uh, joined us and again we are grateful to them for sparing their time and for their con contribution uh, today uh, we have this aios session with the i bank association of america and uh, thanks uh, eba for collaborating with us and i would like to thank particularly dr Ke mr kevin uh, corcoran for uh, uh, doing the whole program and uh, coordinating it and uh, we have a galaxy of speakers and over to rakhi for moderating the session thank you ma'am i'll just first introduce the the co-chair person the chair person and the co-chair person is the screen visible yes so yeah, we have dr g mukherjee is the president of the i bank association of india he also is the president of the ocular trauma society of india and in, in under his ever leadership the i banking in india is doing leaps and bounds and we have another chairperson mr kevin corcoran he is the president and the chief executive officer i bank association of america he is also he guided the association through the to a reorganization of the governance structure and have over 30 years of non profit management experience we have chair co chairperson sorry for the this dr shahzad mia he is in the university of michigan medical school and dr kuresh maskati he is past president aios and he also runs maskati eye clinic in mumbai and a very eminent corneal surgeon with us today a uh, welcome sir for as a convener we have dr ritu arora she is the dean of molana azad medical college delhi and dr rishi mohan outgoing treasurer i bank association of india and medical direct, director mmi tech institute delhi a uh, welcome dr ritu and dr rishi as the co chair persons we have dr manisha acharya she is the medical director i bank of charity i hospital delhi and dr rekha gyanchan she is the chairperson of the south zone of ebai and also is a medical director of lions international i bank uh, bangalore uh, i would like to introduce the first speaker dr jennifer lee jennifer lee is the medical director of the university of california davis sierra donor services i bank she is also the director of the cornea and external disease services Dr Lee completed her medical degree and residency at the Baylor College of Medicine in Boston and subsequently her cornea fellowship in UC Davis she practices focuses on cornea complex interior segment and refractive surgery her research interests include corneal transplantation techniques and eye banking she is actively involved in the resident and fellow education and received the UC Davis ophthalmology faculty surgical training award presented by the resident in 2018 She is currently one of the program chairs for the Cornea Society Fellows Educational Summit and was the program director for the AAO Cornea Semester Today from 2017 to 2019. Over to you, Dr. Jennifer Lee. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, let's pull up my slides here. Hopefully, you guys are seeing all of my slides now. Um, Anyway, good morning to all of you in India. My name, as you've heard, is Jennifer Lee, and I'm uh, one of the cornea surgeons at the University of California, Davis. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm also the chair of the medical advisory board of the iBank Association of America. And I do just want to thank all of you for inviting us to be part of this program today. Um, and I've been asked to start by giving everyone an update on our current EBA guidelines. I have no financial interest to disclose. So before we start discussing really the current state of COVID-19 and eye banking, I think I always like to take a little step back and just look at the state of the pandemic right now. Um, it's kind of hard to believe, at least for me, that it's really just been a little over a year that we started talking and hearing about uh, this new illness that was being reported in Wuhan. Um, it feels like we've lived maybe several lifetimes since then, even though we've spent most of it sitting at home, um, distancing ourselves from everyone else. 
Um, and the truth is I've been giving these updates on COVID-19 and iBank since very early on in the pandemic. And I update this particular slide each time. And each time I do it, I'm sort of reminded of the incredible impact this pandemic has had on our country and on our world. But I will say for the first time that I've given this, this type of presentation, this slide is showing a decreasing number of cases being reported in the US. And worldwide, you can see that the number of cases is trending down. Although obviously there's still many hotspots around the world and places where the pandemic continues to be a, a big concern. But it's starting maybe to feel a little bit like there's a light at the end of the tunnel uh, with multiple vaccines now available. Um, on average in the US, 1.5 million Americans are getting a shot daily with 13% having received at least one dose and 5% of Americans fully vaccinated. Obviously we have a long way to go. The bigger problem of course is the issue of worldwide vaccination with huge disparities in access to COVID vaccines. Uh, wealthier nations are reserving so many doses that other nations are unable to scare enough for their own people. So we really do have a long way to go, not just in the battle against this pandemic, um, but in the battle against health disparities around the globe. In this past year, however, um, the thing that we have all learned a lot about is COVID-19. Um, I'm just gonna give a really brief overview of what we know about the ocular involvement for COVID-19. By now, we're all aware that there can be some ocular involvement for COVID-19. Numerous studies have shown SARS-CoV-2 can be associated with a follicular conjunctivitis, and up to about 30% of patients may develop some form of ocular manifestation. In general, however, it seems as these patients have a normal visual acuity without corneal lesions, pseudomembranes, or anterior chamber inflammation. The rate for a positive SARS-CoV-2 PCR from conjunctival samples ranges anywhere from zero to about 7% in the literature. In most cases, positive conjunctival swabs are seen in patients with conjunctival symptoms, although not all patients with conjunctival symptoms had detectable virus in the tears. Additionally, infectious virus has been cultured from an ocular swab in one case report. Um, the onset for COVID-19 uh, and ocular symptoms is highly variable. In some cases, the ocular symptoms can be a presenting sign of COVID-19, one other cases it seems to develop as a later sign in patients with more severe disease. SARS-CoV-2 RNA has also been, again, detected in conjunctival swabs and tear samples with positive detection as late as 27 days after the initial symptom onset. And recently, there have also been multiple case reports on intraocular involvement, including vitritis, panuveitis, optic neuritis, retinitis, and retinal lesions involving both the inner and outer retinal layers. So really in light of what we now know about COVID-19 and how it can affect the eye, um, the question for us um, as eye bankers is what implication does this have on donor corneal tissue? And this is ultimately what we would all like to know. I'm not gonna go into uh, to talk at length about this. I think Dr. Ho will be addressing his research on this area of SARS-CoV-2 uh, shortly. Um, but just to point out that multiple studies have demonstrated the expression of receptors that are able to bind uh, the viral spike protein for SARS-CoV-2 and potentially allow viral, viral entry into the conjunctival limbus and cornea. Um, a study out of WashU uh, looked to see if SARS-CoV-2 could actually replicate in human corneal tissue. And interesting enough, they were unable to detect replication of SARS-CoV-2 in human corneal tissue. So perhaps this is a, a sign that um, the human cornea and conjunctiva can't support infection with uh, this virus. Um, in terms of the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in human corneal tissue, again, I'm not going to go into this in depth uh, as I'm sure Dr. Mian will discuss this further in his talk, um, but early studies seem to, uh, the studies are, are fairly mixed in terms of the results. An early study by Bayoud um, showed that with 10 eyes uh, from five COVID-19 patients, um, they were not able to detect viral RNA in ocular tissue or intraocular fluid. Um, but since then, other studies um, have found uh, SARS-CoV-2 detectable in corneas of patients. So in the end, um, I would say we really still don't know exactly how SARS-CoV-2 affects donor corneal tissue. So we have to continue uh, to be cautious in terms of the corneas that we're using for transplantation and to err on the side of safety for our recipients. The EBAA Medical Advisory Board 
has been monitoring the COVID-19 pandemic uh, very closely. The Policy and Position Review Subcommittee, which consists of both physicians and eye bankers, were tasked with developing a policy statement and recommendations for eye banks. And the first alert and screening recommendations were sent out at the beginning of February. To say the least, um, these guidances and screening recommendations have been an evolving document. As we've learned more about the disease and as the pandemic has spread across not only our country, but across the globe, um, we've adjusted our screening recommendations with the changing nature of the disease. Early on at the start of the shutdown, the criteria were extremely conservative and included travel screening recommendations, for instance. But now that obviously COVID-19 is everywhere, um, we have continued to discuss some ways, uh, ways in which we can allow for continuation of elective corneal transplantation surgery while still ensuring the safety of the donor tissue. And so the most recent update um, by the PPRS were sent out on October 20th of 2020. Uh, this is a summary of the current COVID-19 screening guidelines and it can be found on the EBA website at restoresite.org. Looking at each section more closely, everything's been laid out in a table format to help make our recommendations as clear as possible to eye banks and medical directors. In the first category, obviously, um, if a donor tests positive for COVID-19 within the past 28 days, they are not eligible for transplantation. If they have tested negative in either a postmortem or a recent pre-mortem PCR test, they may be eligible. Uh, depending on whether or not they've had signs and symptoms of COVID-19, whether another etiology can explain their findings, um, or whether or not they've had a presence or absence of a close contact of COVID-19. Um, these are the signs commonly associated with COVID-19 that we're using for our screening guidelines. Um, they include ARDS, pneumonia, and uh, CT scans showing ground glass opacities. And these are the most common acute symptoms that might be consistent with COVID-19 infection that again, that we're using to help determine eligibility. In terms of close contacts, our definition for cl close contacts has been based on the CDC definition. And finally, if a donor did not have a PCR test performed for SARS-CoV-2, it is still possible for them to be considered eligible for donation if they had no other signs or symptoms of COVID-19 or no other close contacts for COVID-19. Of note, and this is something that comes up frequently, um, at this time, the EBA does not require iBanks to perform universal post-mortem reverse transcriptase PCR testing for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is consistent actually with recent US FDA guidances, which do not recommend routine testing of asymptomatic donors. Um, they state that respiratory viruses are not known to be transmitted by, via transplantation. Um, but there are other reasons why we have not recommended universal testing, including the fact that the testing we have at this time has not been validated for cadaveric donors. Um, there's still a concern for variable false negative rates um, and there's a potential still for persistent positivity of uh, these PCR tests even after recovery from infection. Um, however, if testing has been performed by the iBank or by another donor agency, the results have to be obtained prior to, result, uh, prior to release of the tissue. And although testing is not required, hopefully um, something that's working in our favor is the increased testing of hospitalized patients um, and patients in the outpatient setting. And this will only help to enhance our donor screening. Um, in some cases, uh, from the, the table that you saw, a negative uh, PCR test might be required for a donor to be considered eligible for transplantation. And what you'll find about our guidances right now is that we are relying heavily on iBank medical directors to help with donor eligibility determination. Um, what this has done is it has allowed us to really increase tissue, tissue utilization um, without universal testing. Finally, a couple other considerations to keep in mind as we consider our confidence in the safety of our donor tissue. And this includes uh, medical standards that are already in place to help protect our recipients. Um, that includes the fact that all donors uh, with any sort of acute conjunctivitis um, are ruled out. Uh, and so again, with COVID-19, the vast majority of patients for whom uh, virus is detectable um, have ocular symptoms. Um, and 
uh, in the past year or so, um, we've also put into place um, increased uh, guide, guidances on recovery and the process for recovery, which includes a double povidone iodine uh, rinse of the ocular surface during tissue recovery. Um, povidone iodine has been shown to have virucidal activity against coronaviruses SARS and MERS in vitro. So hopefully this double uh, rinse technique is helping um, with microbial inactivation on the donor ocular surface. Finally, it goes without saying that COVID-19 has had a huge impact on eye banking and the donor pool. Uh, the EBA has been conducting a survey of US eye banks monthly during the shutdown um, and now during sort of the reopening phase. And what we see here is that in March and April, there were virtually no corneal transplantation surgeries being performed except in the case of emergencies. Um, fortunately, domestically uh, in the US, things have been back up in May and June of last year. Um, and many eye banks have been able to recover to about 80 to 85% of their pre-COVID volume um, during that period. Um, but what you see, of course, is that international uh, tissue placement continues to lag significantly. Ultimately, um, there's still a lot that we don't know about SARS-CoV-2 and the impact on corneal donor tissue and transplantation. Fortunately, there have not been any reported cases of any coronavirus transmission, um, whether that's SARS-CoV-2 or SARS or MERS, um, via transplantation of ocular tissue now or in the past. Um, and again, the FDA does not consider respiratory illnesses to be a relevant communicable disease. In the US, we do know of eight uh, reported instances in which corneal tissue from infected donors were inadvertently transplanted. In each of these cases, post-mortem testing was performed by a tissue recovering agency unbeknownst to the eye bank. Fortunately to date, the graft outcomes have been successful in all of these cases, and the recipients did not develop COVID-19 during the early post-operative period. So in summary, the EBA and its member eye banks are working really hard to maintain the safety of the donor tissue. Um, and we continue to monitor the situation closely and update our recommendations as new information becomes available. Um, again, we are attempting to balance um, not just the safety of the donor pool, but also the needs of our recipients and our surgeons. And ultimately more research uh, is needed to really understand the true risk of transmission via transplantation of corneal tissue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jennifer. That was really informative and getting to know more about what's happening in USA regarding the eye banking. Uh, from the uh, uh, team, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, sir, Dr. Ritu Arora, ma'am, Dr. Manisha, do you have any questions for Dr. Jennifer? Yeah, so good morning. I just wanted to say that uh, Though they're saying that SARS COVID testing is not mandatory, EBA has not made it mandatory from the cadavers. But uh, we, I mean, we just did the study when the eye banking started in August, and uh, we found that, and we kind of started doing the PCR testing for all the donors, you know, whether I mean non non COVID suspects, and uh, we found that twenty percent of them came out to be. COVID positive, you know, the corneas were not released till we got the report. So though, I mean, it's been accepted by cornea, but I just wanted to know if anything, any study or anything like that has been done. Um, I believe Dr. Mian will be talking about his study from his eye bank uh, shortly. And so uh, they also found similar types of results. And so it'll be interesting to see what his data shows. Okay, thank you. So we'll move to our next talk then uh, to know more about uh, what's happening regarding the COVID testing. So I would introduce, I would like to introduce a second speaker. One second. Is the screen visible? Mm, no. No? No. Are you sharing screen? Yes, I was sharing my screen. 
just doing one small. Is it visible now? Only your photograph. Yes, now it's visible. Yes, now it will come. Yes, yeah. visible. Okay. So our second speaker is Dr. Shahzad Mia. He's a professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences at University of Michigan Medical School. He also serves at the department as vice chair for clinical sciences and learning. Dr. Mia earned his medical degree in 1996 from the Emory University School of Medicine and completed a residency at the Wills Eye Hospital of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. He is a fellow in cornea and reflective surgery at Howard Medical School. He joined the UM faculty in 2002 and was promoted to associate professor with tenure in 2010. He became professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences in 2016. His research mainly focuses on eye banking, keratoplasty techniques, and oculographs versus host disease. He served as the director of the residency training program between 2004 and 2019, and previously served as fellowship director in the department. He received the Bergstrom Teaching Award presented by ophthalmology residents. He also received the 2007 Anthony Admis Award for outstanding research from the UM Caleb Eye Center and the Senior Achievement Award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. He received the Stresma Award for Resident Education from the University of University Professors in Ophthalmology in 2017 and the Patent Award for Eye Banking from EBA in 2019. He serves as a Senior Medical Director for Eosight Eye Banks as well as on the Board of Directors. He also serves on the board of directors from the Cornea Society and the Eye Bank Association of America. Today, he is going to talk about assessing prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in human postmortem ocular tissue. Over to you, Dr. Mia. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's really a huge honor and pleasure for me to participate in this symposium and thank you for the organizers uh, to, for inviting me. Uh, the work that I will be sharing was uh, partly supported by a targeted research grant on uh, COVID-19 uh, provided by the iBank Association of America. And again, I do serve as a medical director for Eversight iBank uh, where much of the work was conducted. Uh, as you've already heard and know, the COVID-19 pandemic is caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, a highly infectious virus which is transmitted primarily through respiratory droplets and upon contact with infected persons. COVID-19 patients have a high viral, viral load in the upper respiratory tract at disease onset. There's a strong possibility that the virus may contaminate the ocular surface via respiratory droplets after coughing, sneezing, and hand-to-eye contact. In January 2020, an ophthalmologist contracted COVID-19 from an asymptomatic glaucoma patient, and this was the first indication that the ocular surface may serve as a mediator of viral infection. Clinical studies, as Dr. Lee mentioned, have shown ocular manifestations and pres presence of the virus in tears, conjunctiva, retina, tubercular meshwork, and iris. The conjunctiva, uh, as you saw, uh, serves as the most common manifestation and site for presence of disease, uh, although there's quite a huge bit of variability in the incidence and symptoms that may present in patients. Retina is also another site that has been tar uh, shown to be a target where although the patients who've presented have had normal visual acuity, uh, OCT findings have shown hyperreflective lesions in the ganglion cell in their plexiform layers, and even cotton wool spots and microhemorrhages. SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus uh, uses its spike protein to bind to angiotensin converting enzyme 2 as a receptor on human cells, along with the transmembrane protease serine type 2 protein, to, which acts like an enhancer to allow viral entry into host cells. The ocular surface cells of the cornea and conjunctival epithelial cells have been shown to express ACE2 and TMPRSS2. In fact, RNA sequence data in healthy human cells has shown ACE2 expression in the limbus, corneal, and conjunctival epithelium, and again, co-expression with TPMRSS2 in the superficial conjunctiva. 
SARS-CoV-2 can replicate in ex vivo cultures of human con conjunctiva, and this replication seems to be greater than the first SARS-CoV-2 virus. Interesting study looking at risk of transmission inoculated SARS-CoV-2 in the conjunctiva of, of rhesus macaques. The viral load was detected in the conjunctival swab on day one post inoculation and then became undetectable. The macaques went on to de subsequently develop interstitial pneumonia and postmortem analysis revealed viral load detection in the nasolacrimal system, oral cavity, tonsils, pharynx, and lung. The, the hypothesis here is that the transmission is thought to be via drainage through the nasolacrimal system. So the potential for SARS-CoV-2 transmission through the cor uh, through corneal transplant is certainly there, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 being detected in conjunctival secretions of COVID-19 patients, and SARS-CoV-2 found in ocular tissue of living previously infected patients. Although again, there is no report of SARS-CoV-2 transmission through transplants. We wanted to system systematically evaluate the presence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA and proteins in postmortem ocular tissue of COVID-19 positive donors. The route of transmission and infiltration of the virus within the ocular tissue is still unknown, and these questions are obviously critically important to all ophthalmologists, the eye banking industry, and the field of site restora restoring transplantation. When we set out to look at uh, the prevalence of uh, COVID-19, we wanted to look at all donors uh, who met enrollment criteria who were uh, tested positive for PCR within 15 days of death. We divided them into three groups, looking at surgically ruled out tissues in asymptomatic cases with a positive test, symptomatic with a negative test. So these are cases where uh, patients had symptoms as defined by the EBA screening criteria and the CDC, but either were not tested early on or, or were tested negative or were found to be negative through a medical director screening. We also looked at uh, patients who are donors who were close contact with COVID-19 patients as defined by the CDC and EBA screening criteria. So in our um, groups here, we had 18 donors within the asymptomatic COVID-19 positive, where we looked at scleral and corneal um, uh, samples in, um, in both eyes, showing a range of seven, 11 to 17 percent positivity of PCR. We looked at symptomatic COVID-19 who uh, were negative on testing. There were 13 donors with 26 specimens of sclera and cornea with a range of 12 to 15 percent who were positive. And we also looked at two donors who were close contact with COVID-19 patients, but had no symptoms and were otherwise negative. And uh, of these four corneas, none of them tested PCR positive. So overall, after observing 13% of our cases where SARS-CoV-2 RNA was found in surgical to rule out tissue. Our next goal was to systematically evaluate the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in different ocular layers of tissue in patients, in donors who were symptomatic as well as po donor positive. We wanted to confirm that these were truly validated and therefore we did perform nasopharyngeal swab and blood testing on all of these donors where uh, we did PCR nasal, uh, for the uh, nasopharyngeal swabs and did ELISA testing on the blood to look at IgG levels. These corneas were prepared following eye bank practices where they were uh, the standard practice being uh, use of povidone iodine initially, uh, followed by PCR swab for collection of specimen. Uh, and we had a control group for the other eye where we did this without the use of the povidone iodine to see what the benefit of povidone iodine was in these cases. Of course, then we also wanted to confirm looking at spike and envelope protein with immunostaining in uh, a sample of these specimens. So we had 10 uh, symptomatic COVID positive donors that we tested. Uh, as you can see here, they were all uh, pre-mortem COVID-19 test positive. The range of time to death uh, and testing to time to death is listed here, and there was a wide range between one and 15 days. Of these, six out of the 10 were PCR positive from their nasopharyngeal swabs, four were negative, 
and eight out of the 10 were IgG positive on their serology testing. All 10 specimens were at least positive in one of the uh, two postmortem tests, either PCR or uh, on the IgG testing. The two that were IgG negative may have been because they were um, too early in the course of their disease to be IgG positive. When we looked at our specimens for uh, positivity, because we're looking at different uh, layers, all 20 eyes, three conjunctival, one anterior cornea, five posterior cornea, and three vitreous swabs tested positive uh, for SARS-CoV-2, exhibiting a positivity rate of 15% in the conjunctiva, 5% for the anterior corneal surface, 25% for posterior corneal surface, and 15% in the vitreous. We wanted to do uh, further testing to look at immunostaining, looking for the spike in envelope protein uh, within the specimens tested. And for that, we uh, looked for, we'd had a control group with the antibody control using a non-COVID-2 um, uh, antibody and a healthy control where we knew that the donor did not have COVID uh, to look for, again, both the envelope and spike proteins. You can see in the bottom right corner that the corneal surface was positive for viral antigen for the envelope protein and the same specimen in the bottom right corner was positive for surface uh, for the spike protein on the corneal surface. And we did this with uh, uh, specimens that were treated with uh, uh, povidone iodine. Uh, none of the surface specimens were positive for its spike or envelope protein. So um, the impact of postmortem testing was also something that we wanted to look at to explore the utility of routine postmortem testing of all potential donors. In order to do that, we uh, performed postmortem COVID-19 testing in all donors which were intended for surgical use. This included 505 donors uh, that were identified for surgical use through EBA iBank eligibility criteria. Of these 60 donors were not procured, uh, procured for other reasons than um, uh, COVID uh, rule-outs. 126 of these had pre-mortem uh, nasopharyngeal swaps performed at the hospital or the organ, or organ procurement, uh, procurement organization. 48 received um, post-mortem nasopharyngeal swabs performed by the organ pro procurement organization and 266 had testing done through the iBank itself. Of these, 15 tested positive for a percentage of 4.2%. When we look at these 15 cases, none of them had any obvious symptoms, chest X-ray findings uh, that were consistent with EBA criteria and CDC uh, recommendations. Several of these were also reviewed by medical directors and were deemed to be surgically usable um, the three that are highlighted here that were not used was, were because these had uh, were found to ha later have reasons not to be released, such as positive serology testing or other historical findings that were not earlier identified. In summary, our findings suggest that there is a small but noteworthy prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in the ocular tissue of the donors that died from COVID-19 or had related signs and symptoms. Postmortem testing reduced eligible donors by about 4.2%, and of these, 3.7% were by, through the iBank testing. This highlights the importance of donor screening guidelines as set forth by the EBAA and, the, and FDA and CDC. Postmortem nasopharyngeal uh, PCR testing does have a role to consider uh, to identify donors that may still be positive uh, despite the strict screening criteria. And continuation of infection prevention protocols using povidone iodine is at useful for prevention of transmission of COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2. I'd like to thank all our collaborators at the iBank, Wayne State University, and Rush University in conducting our work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaza. This was really very informative. And now I would request the chair and the conveners to, if they have any questions or comments. Yeah, uh, Raki, a question for Shaza. Shaza, when you say that uh, 
you did have a small 4.2% uh, positive rate uh, when you did this uh, study. Uh, is this too small a positivity for the EBA to suggest a change in the guidelines? Because Jennifer says there's no change in the guidelines since October uh, from the EBA in spite of this study. So I guess that the numbers are too small or the percentage is too small. So RI Bank is continuing to do uh, testing for all donors still, um, and we're looking tracking our data for that. Uh, but we are just one iBank, and so we represent a fraction of all the um, donors that are in the U.S. alone. So I think additional data certainly is needed for us to know if there's beneficial, um, there's benefit to routine testing. Um, of course, cost is a consideration, false positivity is a consideration, false negativity is a consideration. So I think these are all factors that must be considered. Uh, I think we have the opportunity to look at this further with uh, more data to really help uh, further define whether there is utility as we also learn risk of uh, transmission of disease. Uh, if I were to make a point, uh, what was the community positivity rate for COVID at that time when your cadavers were having 4.2% positivity because it would be directly in proportion to community COVID rate? That's an excellent question. This was the study was conducted, the data that I showed was through June of 2020, and the community testing rates in the US were quite low in the sense that we did not have adequate testing available between March, April, May, and June in the US. So it's really hard to truly correlate through that time point how this matches up with community rates. Um, what we are looking at our data between July and January of this year, and I, there is a much stronger correlation with community rates and testing that we see uh, at this point. But we could not really conduct that because there was not adequate community testing that was being done. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to say, because from August to December, when we did the study at our iBank, we got 18% positivity in the cadaver donors. And community rate was 20% at that time, you know. So maybe, so maybe this 4%, we really can't say whether it should change the guidelines or not. Uh, just a question, Dr. Shahzad. Uh, is the percentage uh, rate now different because you're now continuously doing the uh, PCR testing? So is it uh, still uh, maintaining to 4% or is it now more or less? It's very close. It's actually close to about 3.5% for the last um, seven months. So since June, um, so it's still tracking in a similar number um, and the community rates have actually been higher. If any more questions or we move to the third speaker then, and then we can come back to the questions afterwards again. Is the slide visible? Yes. Okay. So our third speaker is Dr. Josh H. Ho. He's the Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology, Cornea and External Disease Services of Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Neurosciences, University of Minnesota. He received a BS in Chemistry from Duke University in 2005, where he graduated summa cum laude and an MD from Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine in 2009. He completed an ophthalmology residency at the University of Illinois Eye and M Ear Infirmary in 2013 and a fellowship in cornea and external disease at the University of Illinois in 2014. He's currently the acting medical director of the Lions Gift of Sight Eye Bank and maintains a Minnesota Lions funded research laboratory at the University of Minnesota alongside his busy clinical practice. His research interests include eye banking, tissue processing, and limbal stem deficiency. Due to the impact of COVID-19 on the availability of donor corneal tissue, Dr. Ho has spearheaded collaborative research related to SARS-CoV-2 with prominent virologists at the university. He's going to talk about can SARS-CoV-2 be transmitted through donor corneal tissue and in vitro. So over to you, Dr. Josh, and welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. I'm very thankful to be here and thankful to be a part of this uh, very nice conference. Um, as mentioned before, um, I'm going to talk about an in vitro study we did to evaluate whether SARS-CoV-2 can infect donor corneal tissue, which uh, would put our patients at risk for transmission. And uh, these are my financial disclosures. So a brief background, as you all know, COVID-19 is a global pandemic that started in Wuhan, China. It's caused by the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. It uh, to date has caused more than 2.4 million deaths worldwide. And in the US alone, it is responsible for over 500,000 deaths. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 can infect the eye. Um, they uh, may infect the eye. And so the CDC has recommended eye protection for people at risk for exposure and the EBA has issued guidelines to screen out donors at risk for COVID. And this is based on anecdotal as well as um, clinical evidence that SARS-CoV-2 may infect the eye. The evidence for ocular tropism or the ability of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to infect the eye, like I said, range from anecdotal reports to um, other types of lab studies. The clinical evidence mostly comes from anecdotal reports of um, physicians who have come in contact with SARS-CoV-2 infected patients who had full PPE in terms of N95 masks, gowns, gloves, but exposed eyes and subsequently contracted the disease. This uh, was first reported in China. Um, there have also been reports of ocular symptoms being manifested in patients with COVID-19, and uh, this can range from conjunctival hyperemia to conjunctival congestion to um, uh, other types of uh, corneal subepithelial infiltrates. And this has been reported in 0.8% to 32% of COVID-19 patients. Uh, viral RNA has also been detected in tears, conjunctival secretions of COVID-19 patients, um, as Dr. Shazad Mian had mentioned as well. And then ocular tissues also express viral entry factory factors that are necessary for the virus to invade and infect the cells on the surface of the uh, cornea and conjunctiva. And in particular, ACE2 and TMPRSS2 have been identified and reported on. Um, our lab was also uh, one of the groups that published on this. ACE2 in particular binds to the spike protein uh, that is on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then TMPRSS2 is a serine protease that is necessary to cleave the binding and allow entry of the virus after the binding of the spike protein. So these are all critical and the necessary hardware is there on the surface of the eye. What has not been shown to date is actual live viral studies showing that the virus can infect tissues of the eye. And so our lab basically set out to evaluate in vitro whether using live virus we could infect tissues of the eye. And so we wanted to evaluate the infection of conjunctival epithelium, corneal epithelium, and corneal endothelium using live virus. Uh, we also wanted to evaluate the stability of SARS-CoV-2 virus in corneal preservation medium, because in terms of transplantation, if the virus is not stable in the medium, it is possible maybe that we could quarantine infected tissue and we would still be able to use it down the, right, down the road, maybe seven days out or something like that. Uh, so these were the main questions that we sought to evaluate. And uh, to do this, we obtained two strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. As you all know, the virus is mutating and there are uh, more and more mutations coming out. At the time that the study was done, we were able to get a hold of the SARS-CoV-2 strain from Hong Kong, which was considered to be very similar to the Wuhan strain, but we actually found a, a small difference. Um, but it was essentially the virus that spread to Hong Kong. And then the strain from Washington State in the US, which is where the outbreak in the US initially started. So we had the Washington State strain and we had the Hong Kong strain. And we established these in Vero cells. And Vero cells are basically, in virology, they're the kind of cells that you maintain your viral lines in. Vero cells are basically interferon deficient cells. They come from monkey kidneys. And uh, they're basically highly susceptible to viral infections. And basically, people maintain viruses in Vero cell cultures. So we established these lines in Vero cell cultures just to prove that they were alive, that they're infectious. And then we uh, uh, cultured out several primary explant cultures from corneal, limbal, and conjunctival epithelium. And then we inoculated 
these cultures with the two viral strains at 0 0.5 multiplicity of infection for an hour. So uh, multiplicity of infection means that we infected with enough viral titer that at least half of the cells had the potential to be infected. And then cells were washed and incubated in serum-free culture media at 37 degrees with 5% CO2. 48 hours after inoculation, the cells were then fixed in paraformaldehyde, and then the cells were stained. And using immunohistochemistry, chemistry, we determined whether they were infected by staining against uh, nucleocapsid protein. Now, um, a lot of studies will use, uh, will use spike protein. However, nucleocapsid protein is uh, far more immunogenic, and so you get a much stronger signal, and it's more conserved across viral strains. And so since we're using multiple strains, we stained against nucleocapsid protein. So here are the basically control studies proving that we did have live virus. Uh, these are again in Vero cells, which are interferon deficient cells. Uh, you can see these cells uh, just stained in DAPI, showing the cell nuclei. And then you can see nucleocapsid and spike protein staining positive in these cells that have been infected by the virus. And you can see the merged image where you can see quite a few of the cells have been infected. Um, and this was an uh, infection that was performed with a multiplicity of 0.5, multiplicity of infection of 0.5, and not exactly half the cells are being infected, but you can see the virus is quite infective. And then this is the Hong Kong strain. The last slide was the Washington strain. So both of the viruses, um, obviously active, live, able to infect cells. Um, and then if you don't infect the Vero cells, obviously you don't see any nucleocapsid or spike protein. And so this was a, just a negative control. So we established that we had the virus, that they were alive, that they could infect the cells and culture. And then we decided to uh, infect the corneal epithelium, conjunctival epithelium, and limbal epithelial cultures that we had. This is actually the summary of results, and I'm going to go through each of these samples individually. But uh, in some of these cases, the uh, cell cultures did not, uh, did not do well several days after we did the explant cultures. And so they're listed as ND, that they weren't actually infected. But everywhere you can see the positive mark, you can see the strain did infect cells within the cultures and every, where you see a negative mark, the cells were not infected. So obviously if we didn't infect the cells in the uninfected columns, all of these were negative controls and there was no viral um, infection. For the Washington strain, you can see two out of four of the corneal epithelial cultures were infected for the Hong Kong strain, two out of five. In the conjunctival epithelium, the Hong Kong strain actually infected all six samples while the Washington strain was able to infect half the samples. And then for limbal epithelium, the Washington strain infected 25% of the samples, while the Hong Kong strain infected 50% of the samples. Overall, it seemed like the Hong Kong strain was a little bit more uh, infectious than the Washington strain. So these are actually what the images look like. So on the left, you have the Hong Kong strain, and on the right, you have the Washington strain, and this is for sample 0927. And basically you have the cells in culture, these are conjunctival cells, and the, uh, the red stain here is nucleocapsid protein showing where you have cells that have been infected by the virus. And so the Hong Kong strain wasn't able to infect this, um, these conjunctival cells and the Washington strain as well. And then here you can see the uninfected control. And then when you look at the corneal epithelial cells, the Hong Kong isolate really wasn't able to infect uh, anything. And then when you look at the limbal cells, you can see that the Hong Kong strain was able to infect the uh, limbal epithelial cells that were cultured out. Here's another sample here, both conjunctiva were infected by the Hong Kong and Washington strain, uh, uninfected control. And then if you look at the corneal epithelium, the Hong Kong strain wasn't able to infect the corneal epithelium, but the Washington strain was. And then if you look at the limbal cells, none of the strains were able to infect the limbal epithelial cells in this donor. And then this is another donor. Um, we have the conjunctival epithelial cells, and this time only Hong Kong strain was able to infect the conjunctival epithelium. The Washington strain was not able to infect the conjunctival epithelium. In terms of the corneal epithelium, this donor had the reverse. The Hong Kong strain couldn't infect the corneal epithelium, but the Washington strain was able to infect the uh, corneal epithelium. And then un uh, uninfected controls. And then this is another sample, a different donor, 933. The conjunctival cells cultured out here. The Hong Kong strain was effective. The Washington strain was not. And then if we go to the limbal cells, you can see that neither of them were able to infect the cells. And then if you look at the conjunctival epithelium for this donor, this is 36. 
both of the donors had infections in their uh, conjunctival epithelium. In the corneal epithelium, only Hong Kong was effective. And in the limbal cells, only the Washington strain was effective. And so you can see that the you, see, you can see that there was a wide variety in how the donor tissue reacted to the infections. There was variability in which strains were able to infect and which tissue types were able to be infected. There was no consistency. And so there's obviously donor factors, uh, tissue factors, and also viral strain factors that all affect whether tissue will be infected. And every infection is, is, a, is a probability event. And so it may be that if we did more, more trials that you would see a more consistent pattern with um, the two different strains, but in the samples that we were able to run, we saw a wide variety of um, outcomes, but overall, the reality is that uh, the corneal epithelial and conjunctival epithelial and limbal epithelial cells can all be infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, whether it's the Washington strain or the um, Hong Kong strain. So next, we wanted to look at the infection of actual endothelial cells. And we wanted to look at this in two ways. We wanted to look at endothelial cell cultures, and, and we also wanted to look at um, infections of endothelial cells on actual DSEC lenticules, so actually on, uh, on a graph. So the endo cells were cultured out from uh, cell progen cells that we obtained commercially, and these were inoculated with virus at a 0.5 MOI for an hour. And then we also took DSEC lenticules and flat mounted them in culture wells and then inoculated these at 1.0 MOI for an hour. And we used the Hong Kong strain for these studies because we didn't have a lot of tissue at this time. And the Hong Kong strain was more uh, infective compared to the Washington strain in our previous studies. Uh, the samples were washed and then incubated in culture media at 37 degrees or and 5% CO2. 48 hours post inoculation, the cells were fixed in prayer formaldehyde. And then we stained for nucleocapsid protein to confirm infection in the cells. So here you can see the corneal endothelial cells that were cultured out. Um, neither the Hong Kong nor the Washington virus was able to infect the endothelial cells in culture. And, and remember, these are commercially available cells. So these were not primary cultured from donors. Um, so we were excited about this. We we're like, oh, maybe endo cells are, are somewhat resistant to infection. And maybe we can just safely do DMEC in all the COVID positive donor tissue. Uh, but then when we looked at the DSEC graphs, we found that the virus can, in fact, infect the endothelium. And uh, we tested four different DSEC graphs, and two of them did become infected by the Hong Kong strain of the virus. And here you can see this is the uninfected control. The sort of red gain is really high, so there's some background noise there. But uh, essentially, there's no viral infection here. And then in these two donors, you can see these sort of plaques where the cells are infected by the virus. Um, and this is the Hong Kong strain. Here's a zoomed out view of the DSEC graft. And you can see these uh, viral plaques where the cells have clearly been infected by the virus. So um, unfortunately, it seems like even the endothelium can be infected by the virus. Um, then the last thing we did was we tested the viral stability in life force C medium. Um, again, one of the things we're hoping was that the virus would not be stable in life or C and some sort of a quarantine period could be instituted to allow us to use COVID positive tissue uh, if, and that assumes that the sort of virus after a couple of days dies off and then now you have a, a tissue that's clear to be used. Um, and so to test this, we basically took life or C and standard CVCs, corneal viewing chambers with and without corneas, and then we inoculated them with the Hong Kong strain of the virus at one times 10 to the fifth TCID 50. And, and TCID 50, by the way, is a measure of viral titer. It's not exactly the same as measuring plaque forming units, but it's about one to 0.7, um, but, but it is a measure of viral titer. Uh, samples were then stored at four degrees Celsius and then at days 0, 1, 2, 4, 7, and 14, we took small aliquots out of the CVC and we tested them and quantified the viral titers in those little aliquots. And then 48 hours, um, the infected wells were then <coughs> identified again by standing against nucleocapsid protein. So uh, if you look at the virus stability, in life or C, you can see from the graph on the right that basically the virus is extremely stable in life or C. So uh, unfortunately, our hope that 
the virus would not be stable in life or see and that we could maybe quarantine the tissue for a short period of time and get away with using the tissue uh, did not hold true. So the virus is super happy in life or see. Um, our virologists kind of hypothesized that it's uh, the, some of the conjoint sulfate or sorb uh, conjoint sulfate or some of those things that <clears throat> stabilize the membrane, cell membranes in life or see that make the that make the virus super happy. In fact, viruses are often stored in, in things like sorbitol and things like that because they, they help stabilize um, envelope viruses. So um, you can see that the viral titers from day zero, one, two, four, seven, 14, they go down maybe um, one log unit, which is not uh, a significant drop in viral titer across 14 days. Um, this is extremely stable in life or C. Um, we tested it actually with a cornea in the CBC because cornea tissue, any, any live tissue, the cells can release defensins that may affect viral titers. Uh, additionally, if the cells get infected by the virus and start to actively shed additional virus, then you may see an increase in viral titers. And basically with the cornea in the CBC, we again see a very, very stable level of viral titers across 14 days. Um, in fact, there was almost no drop, not even a single log drop in, in the viral titers across 14 days. So uh, basically, the virus is very stable in our, our preservation medium at four degrees Celsius, and, and there's no way a quarantine would, would make positive donor tissue suddenly usable. Uh, so in conclusion, SARS-CoV-2 can infect corneal, limbal, conjunctival epithelium, and this conveys a risk for transmission um, of disease through the ocular surface. SARS-CoV-2 can also infect corneal endothelium, and this again conveys a risk of transmission with even endothelial keratoplasty. Uh, the infectivity may vary for different viral strains and for different donors. And um, at this point, we don't have enough samples to clearly map out what donors are more likely to be infected or what donors are not. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is very stable in corneal preservation media and cold storage up to 14 days. So there's not really any, any evidence to suggest that quarantining the tissue would be an effective strategy. And obviously further studies are needed to evaluate the impact of donor characteristics on infectivity. So um, as it stands, I think the data from these live viral infections suggests that uh, the ocular tissues can be infected and there is a risk for uh, infected tissue holding that virus out to 14 days in, in storage. And so we do have to be cautious that these uh, transplanted tissues could potentially uh, transmit virus into the recipient. So um, these are my references. Um, I'm not a virologist, I'm a cornea specialist. So none of this is really possible without a, a really robust team of virologists willing to support us. In fact, all these infectious, infectious studies were done in a biosafety lab level three um, because you can't handle the SARS-CoV-2 virus outside of a BSL-3 lab. Um, so uh, I really, really want to thank my team, Maxim Sharon, Declan Schroeder, and Venkat Krishna um, were the virologists who helped us. Uh, Heidi was the one who did all the immunohistochemistry, and Dr. Yuan, who's the director of research at our iBank, um, also helped spearhead this project. Uh, special thanks to Alliance Gift of Sight for providing tissue for us for our research study, and special thanks to the iBank Association of America for funding the research with a pilot grant. Very insightful, Dr. Josh, and I'm pretty sure that the, all the experts here will have questions for you, definitely, because this is very yeah. alarming also for the banking. Uh, not really alarming, Raki. Josh, I, I think your, your study mm -hmm. has been taken in conjunction with uh, Jennifer's first talk, where uh, she said that uh, there is no re re record of any respiratory virus like the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, ever having uh, entered through any root, any transplant root, any transplanted tissue root and causing SARS-2 uh, or any other respiratory infection in um, the recipient. So I think taking that in conjunction with this, yes, there is a theoretical risk that, that from your studies, which shows that clearly that even an endothelial graft can uh, uh, bring COV to, uh, to the recipient. But after that, what happens? It, I think it remains in the cornea and doesn't cause any infection uh, to the lungs or to the, any other 
part of the recipient. So I think we are still okay doing the grafting. Josh? Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is obviously a theoretical risk. Like, uh, like Jennifer said, there hasn't been any evidence that uh, you can transmit the disease through corneal transplantation. In fact, there have been reports of people receiving blood on accident from COVID positive patients and not having a problem. Um, there was one, I've seen one report where a patient got a liver from a donor who later was tested positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the recipient developed a SARS-CoV-2 related hepatitis, um, not actual COVID-19 lung disease, but the, but the liver became inflamed. Um, so uh, it's not clear exactly, you know, what the risk with uh, transmission is and, and, and every transplant organization and even blood donation, they're all dealing with this because everyone is worried about the risk, but they don't know how careful they need to be. Um, bone marrow, I think there's been at least one case where someone got bone marrow from a positive COVID-19 patient and so far has done okay. Um, and that's maybe concerning too, especially because the recipients are usually immunosuppressed. Um, so, so yeah, we, we haven't seen it yet. Um, uh, and, and you could say, well, that's, that's, that's a good reason to feel confident that, that we're okay to transplant the tissue. But at the same time, I think, um, I think we still have to be cautious. And I, I do think that the screening criteria that the EBA has in place is warranted and, and we should still be cautious because I think if we're just um, unrestricted transplantation of all positive COVID tissue, I think we may end up transplanting some high viral titer tissue that eventually does bite us. And, uh, and, and, and you don't wanna be the doctor whose patient <laughs> gets that one, I would say. So uh, we try our best. I, I, do, I do feel like, um, you know, we, we get away with, with, with probably transplanting some infected tissue. Like Jennifer said, there was at least eight cases where it happened. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we don't, we want to sort of be laissez-faire about it or, or drop our guard about it. True. If I understood uh, clearly, you showed in one of your slides, uh, slides that uh, this virus is viable till 14 days in endothelial cells. In that situation, if the whole scenario of changes, because this is, remains uh, in the tissue for longer time, the trans trans uh, transfer of the uh, this COVID-19 or the, this thing will uh, pass on to the other person. That, that means quarantine time will be 14 days for that matter. Uh. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I heard the question correctly. So you're you're asking about uh, quarantine time, the 14 days, no, the significance of the 14 days? You have shown in one of your slides mm -hmm. that the virus is there in the endothelial cell up to 14 days. Am I correct? Uh, not, in the, not in the endothelial cells, in the, in the preservation media. In the preservation media. That means this virus remains alive for 14 days. Did yeah, so that, that's actually live virus. So that that those that viral titer was quantified using a TCID fifty assay, which is actually a, a live viral assay. So those are all infectious viral particles. That is not uh, transmiss uh, transmissible to the human. Um, I I think if you put it in someone's lungs, it, it would definitely be transmissible and infectious. Um, the question is whether you know, it, it really causes COVID-19 disease if that is transplanted into the eye. I think we should be avoiding trying to transplant these COVID positive tissues because of the that persistence case, of the uh, virus. In that case, uh, the problem will be the quarantine factor. Because we, so far we are uh, thinking that this virus remains alive for very long time, very short time. But with, with this study, if it is 14 days, it is a longer time. Yeah, yeah. So, like I said, Life 4 C has has conjoined sulfate and other things that stabilize cell membranes, and it's in there to help maintain the corneal endothelium. Uh, but SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus, and envelope viruses, basically anything that stabilizes their envelope, allows them to persist in the environment much longer. Um, normally, envelope viruses are actually they don't persist as long in the environment as non-envelope viruses. Um, because they rely on the integrity of their envelope 
um, and and viral just desiccation in the environment. Um, if if it's just on a like a surface like a metal surface, um, those viruses degrade basically. So like on on a, on, on a surface, you know, the virus will will survive several hours, um, but in life or C, you see it surviving out to 14 days. And I think it's because of the controlling sulfate and other things in, in the life or C that actually stabilize the cell membrane very well. Um, like I said, viruses are normally stored in things like sorbitol that stabilize, un enveloped RNA viruses like SARS-CoV-2 are stored in things like sorbitol that stabilize the envelope. And that's basically what life or C does. I just have one more question. Um, when we are uh, doing this study, uh, when we are getting a tissue from the donor, we are putting povidone iodine. So was, I mean, uh, practically when we are doing, we're not implant, uh, inoculating the live virus there. So was there any way, uh, would you think, I mean, in any probability, would it be different when we are practically harvesting with the double iodine or will it still remain the same? Um, I think that might be a better question for Dr. Mian, but I think based on his study, you know, sometimes they, they found viral RNA in the vitreous, they found it in the posterior cornea. And so I think if it, the tissue is contaminated and you're putting into optosol or corneal preservation media, you have the potential to inoculate the media. Um, and then also the double providone iodine, I don't think was 100% effective in eliminating all of the viral RNA. So I think even with double providone iodine, there's still a chance that positive tissue can be infected. That's correct. That was what our finding was. It certainly reduced uh, the percentage of uh, positive RNA antigens that were found, but it did not eliminate it. Again, this was in symptomatic COVID positive donor tissue. Um, I think the EBA criteria, screening criteria are really helpful in screening out a lot of the uh, uh, concerns that we have with donors. So following that, we really do eliminate or reduce the risk overall um, in terms of transplantation. But yes, in COVID positive symptomatic donors, beta, uh, povidone iodine reduces the amount of antigen found, but does not eliminate. Thank you. One, one caveat th to that, though, is, is I think Dr. Mian was looking at uh, viral RNA, I think, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're live virus. I mean, it, it could be just viral, viral RNA that's still there. Um, but still, based on his study, I would be worried that any, any infective tissue could still uh, be a source to inoculate the, the optosol and, and, and the virus would then persist in the tissue until transplantation. So, uh, when we're talking about viral infection or COVID infection, uh, the viral load is something we all talk about. Like that is what is uh, going to lead to an infection, actually or not. I mean, just an abstract thought. Will it make a difference here that the amount of number of virus or the particles which you found was you think substantial enough? Yeah. So. It's 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 very interesting because I don't think there's been any anything that's sort of published that says exactly how many infect, in, infectious viruses you need in the bloodstream to develop an infection or, or how much you need getting to your mucous membranes before you develop an actual infection. So there's no there's no threshold viral titer. Um, I mean, it, you look at all these positive tissues that may be getting through our screening criteria, and you're wondering why we don't see any any people getting infected. Um, but you also look at, you know, like how many positive, um, how many corneas we get that are positive for a bacterial infection, you know, and, and we don't see that many corneal infections from transplantation either. And so like there, there must be some threshold where you have to have enough infectious titer there to actually get an infection. And maybe it's just that you don't ever get that much, that high of an infectious titer in the tissues. Um, I mean, you, you could see even the flat man desect that, you know, it wasn't like the entire desect graft was floridly infected with the virus. And, and we infected it with a 1.0 MOI. That's a 1.0 multiplicity of infection. So we calculated the estimated number of endothelial cells on that desect graft and we infected with as many viral particles, uh, enough viral particles that every single one of the cells on that desect graft could have been infected. And you saw like several plaques in different areas around the desect graft, but the, obviously the entire graft wasn't infected. And so, um, there, there must be some higher threshold of 
infectious viral particles that you need to really uh, transmit um, to disease. And I don't know if infected tissue can get to that, but we don't even know what that threshold is. And, and until we do, I, I think caution is warranted. And so again, I still stand by sort of the EVA screen criteria. I think it's important. Um, but but maybe that's that's a reason why we haven't seen transmission from blood donation. Because you know the viral RNA in blood, even though you can find it, it's it's, it's very low. Um, and maybe that's why we haven't seen it in corneal transplantation yet. Um, no one, no one has tried transplanting lung, obviously, because the lungs of most COVID nineteen patients don't look great. Um, but, but I think if you did, you might actually see disease transmission. Thank you, Josh. We'll come back to the questions again, and we'll move to the fourth talk first. So, I would like to introduce our fourth speaker. Is the screen visible? Yes. Yeah. So our fourth speaker is Dr. Namrata Sharma. She is the dynamic honorary secretary of AIOS and iBank Association of India. And she is currently working as a professor of ophthalmology in the cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery services at Dr. RP Center Ames, New Delhi. Her, cl her clinical work includes phacoemulsification surgeries and foldable IOS implantation and eczema laser refractive procedures, such as LASIK, PRK, SMILE, and FAKIC IOS. She has two patents on Natasol and Natamatrix to her credit and is the brand ambassador for the TFOS due to in India. She has eight international awards and many, many national awards to her credit and has been the principal investigator in many multicentric international FDA trials. She has more than 380 publications in international peer-reviewed journals, has authored 11 books, and is actively involved in various teaching programs. She is going to present the scenario of Indian eye banking and COVID era. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Raki, for that kind uh, introduction. And I think it's a great, uh, exciting session, which has uh, brought out so many useful findings and so many useful insights and it is I think all about mutual learning from each other because all of us like COVID are also in different uh, stages of eye banking somewhere it has picked up and somewhere it is not as much as it should uh, pick up and so it helps to mutually uh, learn it helps in mutual learning with each other so I would be talking about eye banking uh, and eye banking alternatives in the COVID-19 era and uh, for us, this was a revelation just before the COVID, this came out that in our country, corneal opacity is the second cause of, commonest cause of blindness after cataract. It used to remain the fourth and from fourth, it has now jumped to second. Uh, there are 1 million uh, bilateral blind and 6.8 million people who have visual acuity less than six by 60 and curable by keratoplasty is about 10%. Uh, new patients per year added are 40 to 50,000 blind patients uh, and blindness primarily due to cornea. Now, as soon as the COVID came up, uh, there was advisory from the government of India to stop the eye banking completely. And uh, so we came out with guidelines for cornea and eye banking in the COVID era. And this uh, guidelines from All India Ophthalmological Society not only had the uh, uh, guidelines for cornea and eye banking, but had in each and every spe subspeciality. And so this was almost 104 uh, pages document. And as far as the cornea and eye banking is concerned, we collaborated with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare because we wanted them to understand that eye banking has, has, has been hit. And uh, uh, of course, All India Ophthalmological Society, the Cornea Society of India, and the in, in Indian Society for Cornea and Keratorefractive Surgeons, and all these were done on discussions in the various Zoom meetings. So we came out with version one on 11th May when lockdown was announced in our country, then version 2 on 1st September 2020, and then version 3 on 5th October 2020. And this was also published in the Indian Journal of uh, Ophthalmology uh, after a consensus document was made. Now, uh, it was not made mandatory to collect the nasal swab of the disease donor for RT-PCR. It was left to the medical director, but it was uh, emphasized that technicians and the relevant staff should be given training about PPE, and one has to follow the local THOTA, NOTO, SOTO, ROTO, or state health authority or NPCB for daily or weekly reports. 
and the i banks because in our country health is a state subject and each state governs it separately and has a different set of rules so one has to follow the local state government uh, rules exclude criteria for ocular uh, tissue collection uh, where uh, they were tested for covid covid positive or if there was any suggestion uh, thereof in the form of fever or acute respiratory illness or evidence of conjunctivitis or ARDS or ground glass opacities uh, on the x-ray. Now the algorithm uh, that we followed was this, that if the diseased donor was there in the hospital and it was a confirmed case of COVID or exposed to a confirmed case of COVID or has lived in or visited any affected part within the previous 28 days, then you have to assess the clinical situation. And if it is compatible with COVID-19, then uh, no uh, donation, but if uh, there are no symptoms compatible with COVID-19 and screening for COVID-19 has been done and it is positive, then of course there is no donation. But if it is negative, then you can proceed with uh, donation. And very uh, safe cases were only taken for eye banking with no epidemiological risk and no evidence uh, clinically thereof. So uh, general functioning guidelines were as, uh, there, as was there for the entire ophthalmological practice, which included the relevant history taking. And we do uh, enucleate eyeballs also in some parts of the country, almost to the tune of 40%. So we recommended that only corneoscleral rim excision be uh, taken and avoid the whole eyeball enucleation. Then use intermediate preserve med preservative media because in our part of the world, a lot of MK media is still being used. Uh, the eyes which were not used at that time were all shifted to glycerol uh, to prolong their uh, life so that at least they could be used for therapeutic purposes. And recovery procedures mandatorily required double contact of povidine iodine to ocular tissue before retrieval. Then all the donor forms and documents to be exposed to UV light immediately uh, after the team arrives at the eye bank. Uh, the technicians who handled uh, tissues and materials had to follow strict uh, COVID appropriate behavior and also the eye donation counselors who were on call and did not were not placed at the at the site then of course frequent hand washing masks which is mandatory and social distancing as well as staff training in all the eye banks uh, was uh, done and this is uh, from eye bank society of rajasthan some of the pictures and uh, from shroff charity eye hospital uh, where uh, dr manisha charya is the medical director who's with us today and uh, we also did a survey and also looked at our data and we found that the collection of the eyes had gone down uh, by almost uh, 78 to 80 uh, percent in, in March to May 2020. And this was uh, during the lockdown. And our tissue distribution also was decreased uh, by 82 percent. The corneas collected when we compared with 2020 and 2019 in the same era, there was a market decrease in the corneas which were uh, collected. 93% drop in the number of transplants in the last four months, that is April, May, June, July, when we compare it with the previous years. And uh, only this was a survey that we conducted and only 50% said that they would get back to normal and it will take six months or more than six months. But now I think we are almost a year and we've still not gotten back to normal. Uh, most people had shifted from MK media to Cornisol. Cornisol is something like Optisol only it is made in India. And uh, so it is cheaper as compared to optisol. And also people had started using glycerin and glycerol, which earlier uh, it was not being used. And transplant surgeries had markedly gone down because we were only uh, told to do therapeutic uh, keratoplasty and not uh, elective surgeries. Uh, special eye training to eye bank staff before restarting the operations was done by 80% of the eye banks. Voluntary attrition of the staff also occurred due to COVID because some people didn't want to do these duties. This was to the tune of 7.3%. Of course, whenever COVID positive donors were there, no eye bank uh, uh, took those eyes. Nasal swab testing, uh, although uh, uh, the eye bankers felt that it should be done for all donors to the tune of 40%, but almost 40% were not doing it. And surgery only for COVID-19 test report of the recipient again, although similar percent, 40% felt that it should be done, but 37% were still doing without this test. Teleconsultation or teleophthalmology had increased uh, drastically to the tune of uh, almost 70%. And then in these times when we did not have the tissue, there were a lot of other alternatives were looked into like glycerin preserved cornea, sclera, tissue adhesives, conjunctival hood, tasso raffi, tenens patch graft, etc. So uh, 
This was uh, a U tool that was devised because uh, the patients of corneal ulcer, uh, they could not uh, follow up uh, with us. So this was devised in our casualty by our senior resident, Dr. Rahul Bafna. So these are just Sherma strips which are being taken. And uh, this U tool device was made so that patients didn't have to, you know, come to follow up and they could probably do this at home only. This is being done in our casualty services. So if you take a smartphone, and you click a picture of this and uh, these pictures were then sent to us and uh, of course in a hospital you can do it with a fluorescein uh, staining also and in children it was really helpful because the parents would take these pictures and we could follow up uh, fate of corneal ulcers uh, using this so this was uh, one of the innovation which was done at our center during this time then uh, there were uh, lack of tissue so we did uh, use other kind of tissue like uh, tenens patch and these are some of the cases which actually required cornea but tenens graft was used because it was readily available from the patient's own eyes without having any rejection since it was autologous and these are some of the pictures uh, of tenens patch graft to uh, suture the corneal perforations then we did a lot of uh, conjunctival flaps as well also because uh, in those because the corneas were not available then amniotic membrane transplantations were also done uh, from the amniotic membranes which were previously available to us and uh, this is uh, the uh, to show how tenens patch graft it helps although for corneal perforations there are a lot of alternatives which are available which include your glue cyanoacrylate glue then it includes your conjunctival flaps, then your amniotic membrane transplants. But uh, we thought tenens uh, is a good uh, idea. Uh, and this was described almost uh, four years ago by us because the tenens capsule has a fibrous capsule in it and that helps in the fibrosis if you look at the histopathology. So these small perforations uh, also could be uh, dealt with uh, the tenens and the important thing is that you just debride the necrotic epithelium and even make a small uh, tunnel sort of a thing where the tenens can be tucked in. Now this uh, tenens is readily available in the patient's own eye and this is dissected and uh, it's a very flimsy tissue so you can just uh, make it like a pillow and uh, tuck it inside the pocket which was previously created and then apply glue on it. And if it is a larger one, then we can even apply sutures on it. And this is followed by the uh, glue, which is applied on from all sides. Fibrin glue can be applied, even cyanocrylate glue can be applied, and then bandage contact lens uh, following this. This is another case of perforation, which was uh, managed by Tenen's uh, patch graft. And these cases do look good. And over a period of time, there is fibrosis, but for paracentral perforations, they do well. And uh, this, uh, this fibrotic or fibrosis of the corneal haze also clears up over a period of time. It doesn't clear up completely, but it does fade away. And this is follow up one year and the AC is uh, formed in the uh, post-operative period. Now, uh, it can be obtained from the patient's own eye, so you don't need an eye bank for it. Uh, you don't need a, uh, um, the expensive uh, features that you require for amniotic membrane, a lab uh, to, uh, to procure it or harvest it. Uh, it can be sutured as is shown here also. It can be sutured uh, using a suture. It could be tangier or monofilament nylon suture, which can be used to suture it. And then uh, after doing it, one can form the anterior chamber also. And we have described this uh, in our review article as well, which is published in Survey of Ophthalmology that there are so many things which are available, but tenens is yet another thing which can be added to our armamentarium in the event that you don't have a corneal tissue available, which is a reality in our part of the world, which may happen. And we use this uh, during the pandemic as well. So uh, uh, there are no rejections because it's the patient's own tissue. So that is yet another uh, benefit uh, from it. People did use uh, glycerol preserved corneas also. Um, and this is a report, wonderful report by Dr. Neeti Gupta from Ames Rishikesh, where they've used glycerol preserved corneal tissue in emergency corneal transplantation because the corneal tissue was not available. Then people have even used fresh sclera and also multi-layered uh, cortex uh, for uh, corneal perforations. So these can be some of the alternatives and God forbid if we have another pandemic or any other exigency likewise, then these are the things which we can look at. So in the COVID times, eye banking has taken a major hit. 
and uh, it was in uh, in uh, december only that hcrp program and the voluntary donation both were allowed prior to this it was not allowed and so now it has started picking up and alternatives of corneal tissue are here to stay even in the post covid times especially in those places and these can be used as an interim procedure where uh, these are uh, where corneal tissue is not available so thank you very much uh, for your uh, kind attention thank you so much ma'am for such an informative uh, talk uh, any questions from the experts still any comments i think these were very unconventional mm -hmm. times and at that point i still remember the i bank association of india guidelines they really helped quite a lot to to at least start the i banking process which had uh, come to quite a halt in the entire country so i i think that that was something fabulous which was done at that point when we were struggling with what to do next i do remember we did a lot of international i bank programs also and dr jennifer lee and kevin both were a part of it and we would really like to thank them because our own uh, people from ministry of health and welfare we had invited during these webinars and it helped us to you know do advocacy and to tell them that international i banking has already started so you should also look in this direction and that really helped us to start our i banking especially dr jennifer lee's two presentation where i still remember you said that inadvertently you uh, the the covid positive corneas were transplanted and uh, still nothing happened so that helped us uh, a lot in uh, uh, generating uh, uh, generating opinion at the level of the government to you know allow this to happen so thank you jennifer for that and kevin for always uh, helping us uh, in our endeavors though at the local level and dr ritu ma'am you have a i bank which is which is uh, connected with the largest one of the largest uh, hospitals in delhi and in india of course with the very high mortality rate so how is the impact on your your i bank after covid are the things coming back to normal or how do you see this coming forward now i think mm -hmm. yeah dr ritu has done a lot of studies also ma'am uh, would you please uh, so i just want to say that the hospital to which we were attached to or are still attached to uh, the largest hospital that was converted completely covid you know so we were massively affected because we mainly run on hospital cornea retrieval program so we could not retrieve any corneas during that time rather even now we can't retrieve any corneas so we we started actually we did come back to i banking in the month of august that is mainly because we had some political pressures in a sense that uh, parents of some of the politicians were had died and they wanted to donate the eyes so you know though the guideline was not there but then one couldn't refuse at that time so we did start collecting the eyes under those circumstances wearing pp and complete precautions at that time meanwhile i just want to say that uh, we had those counselors running in the hospital cornea retrieval program and since their salary was funded by certain organizations so since the output was nil so they started questioning and they couldn't understand why it was happening so we then posted uh, you know we put our counselors a on to you know pl that time plasma donation had started so their counseling experience came very handy in uh, you know motivating people for plasma donation so we also wrote about it that you know utilizing the services of uh, i bank counselors during pandemic and plasma plasma donations that is number 1 number 2 in august when we started we posted our um, counselors in the mortuary area in the police mortuary which is the largest mortuary of the city uh, and to a surprise that we started getting very good results from there and uh, shroff charity also goes over there so we share the corneas from that place and uh, the we because there are a lot of unnatural deaths mainly due to hanging poisoning accidents so since we were getting corneas from 20 year old donor 25 year old donor and there was no way you know one could refuse 
that is the time when we thought of uh, making our own protocol and uh, since nothing no guideline nothing was available so we started doing the rt pcr of these cadavers uh, along with uh, the cornea retrieval the protocol we followed was that before we would do a uh, before we would do a cornea retrieval and uh, the eye bank technician or the doctor who would go for cornea retrieval used to do first rapid antigen test on these uh, donors only if rapid antigen test was negative they would go on to retrieve the corneas though we know the positivity of rapid antigen test is only 30% but uh, just as as a beginning we started that and between 1st of august 2020 to 31st december 2020 we had 58 donors so we did retrie- retrieved uh, 100 and actually 59 donors 118 corneas were retrieved and since the quality of cornea was so good uh, we did lots of uh, endothelial surgery at, at that time but as i was been sharing before that we got about 18% positivity rt pcr from these donors who had no history of any contact with covid and had not died due to covid so of course and uh, whenever we were i mean since we were doing covid testing for all the donors the iconias were released only after we made sure that covid test was negative for us uh, though there was a lot of debate going on as to funding and who would pay for the covid test since ours is an absolute delhi government hospital so we did not have any question of funding because uh, the rt pcr tests were done free and they were based they are basically supported by the delhi government and reports are available within 24 hours so that way we did not even delay the surgery i can just say that in one incident where uh, when we retrieved the cornea uh, it was just that a day before rt pcr report was available from donor that it was rt pcr negative so when we retrieved those corneas this was a 75 year old woman we did not do the rt pcr in this patient and uh, next day i went ahead and used one cornea for a lamellar corneal graft dalk and immediately after that i received a call in a sense that the family had meanwhile donated the body and since the body was received at our anatomy department and it's a protocol in anatomy department that they always do the rt pcr of the donor so they had resorted to rt pcr of the donor at that time which was reported to be positive but as inadvertently i told you i had already used that cornea for the malar keratoplasty so the other cornea we didn't use the patient has been followed up and we did not find any covid symptomatology in this recipient so as lee has been saying jennifer has been saying that inadvertently we we did not get any covid in the recipient but uh, yes we are uh, very sure that uh, covid testing i feel should be done in the donor uh, before you really release those corneas and uh, so namrata talked about the other means in these measures so for us we could explore the other site from where we can get corneas rather our cornea collection has of late increased you know it has increased in the last two months because this site this mortuary was not available to us but it was given to us considering that our main hospital was covid positive so we are now gradually coming back because hospital has just been declared to start operating start getting the you know non covid status mm-hmm. so so we are again coming back to our hcrp which is just about 2 weeks old but we are again relying a lot upon the mortuary eyes and earlier my death in nucleation time was maybe 3 hours 4 hours but now my dt goes to 10 to 12 hours because mm-hmm. these are now unnatural mm-hmm. yeah but uh, overall results have been pretty good. So that's all about it so thank you so much for your kind comments ma'am and uh, i think we had a great session rakhi would you want to wrap up yes ma'am so thank you to all the speakers um, 
the chair, uh, Kevin, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, really uh, thankful to all for giving your time. Uh, Dr. Josh, Dr. Jennifer, Dr. Shazad, Dr. Namrata, thank you for great talks. They were really very informative. And hopefully in the near future with new uh, things coming in with the COVID uh, research and all, we'll, have, we'll be able to get more insights. Thank you, Dr. Kuresh Maskati, sir, Dr. Ritu, ma'am, uh, for the great insights again. Dr. Manisha, ma'am, Dr. Rekha, thank you again. And thank you all for the wonderful session and hope to meet you all very soon again, uh, virtually as well as in person as well. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Brother, you want to invite them for the AIOS in yes. June in Kolkata? I don't, know I'll, I don't know whether they'll come or not, but yes, virtually we virtually, will have you virtually. as speakers. Virtually. And if you want to come face to face, you're most welcome. We'll be happy to have you here. Since but we're having we a have hybrid them. meeting, number of the dates, yeah. The dates are uh, 24th to 27th June. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Love to see love Thank to see you. some of you at least with us. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the US team for staying up so late with us. Thanks again. My pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Thank Good you. night. Good night. Bye. Bye, Shazar. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Nice see you. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, Jennifer.